Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. If you haven't watched part one of my fourth turning series, go watch it right now, or you'll be lost. I'll assume you've seen it and understand at least the concept of the Strauss-Howe generational theory. So let's go into more detail about the four turnings in a seculum and the generational archetypes that drive it. With this understanding, you'll know how the turnings operate and how they drive society forward. It's no accident or some fickle whim of fate or divine plan. It's people acting on their individual self-interest in ways that, as groups, conform to historical patterns and archetypes. We will begin with the generational archetypes. Generations born during a turning will, as a group, show certain characteristics. These characteristics will be consistent for that turning no matter the time period. This is the archetype, and as the turnings always occur in order, so too does the archetypes appear in sequence and enter the four stages of life in order. These four stages are childhood, young adulthood, midlife, and elderhood. Members of a generation can live past their elderhood, but their numbers are too small to have any meaningful economic, political, or social impact. Note that some date the beginning and ending of generations differently than how Strauss and Howe did. For example, the last millennials were born in 2001, Gen Z beginning right after. However, according to Strauss and Howe, Gen Z will not start until 2008, the beginning of the fourth turning. For the purposes of this video, we will be using the Strauss and Howe model. Now the first generational archetype are what I call the screw-ups. Believe me, that's the most polite term I could think for them. Strauss and Howe refer to this generation as the prophet generation, and I've seen them referred to as idealists, but let's be honest here, they're total screw-ups. Following society's latest brush with disaster, the new babies hatching are raised to answer big questions about themselves and society. All their material needs are met by overindulgent parents so they can self-actualize, ask grand moral questions about society, institutions, and life, and maybe even arrive at some answers. Previous screw-up generations were the Transcendentals, born 1792 to 1821, the Missionary Generation, born 1865 to 1882, and the Baby Boomers, born 1945 to 1964. If the Baby Boomers are anything to go by, why they're the screw-up generation should be pretty self-explanatory. They're the worst. The second archetype are what I call the Pariahs. Strauss and Howe call this archetype the Nomad Generation. Children of this generation are underprotected by parents and are encouraged to go out into society and bring back the kind of success that their parents enjoyed, only to fall short of expectations as society becomes self-focused, attacking institutional power and crime on the rise. Frustration breeds rebelliousness and cynicism, earning the ire of society who will regard the pariahs as a bad generation. Previous pariah generations include the Gilded Generation, born 1822 to 1842, the Lost Generation, 1883 to 1900. Gee, I wonder what society thought of them to give them that name. And Gen X, born 1964 to 1981. As the first Gen Xers were graduating college, they were slurred as a rising tide of mediocrity. It's worth noting that Strauss and Howe referred to Gen X as 13ers, but all refer to them as Gen X. The third archetype is the Civics, otherwise known as the Hero Generation. Once you understand their place in the seculum, the reason they are called heroes becomes rather obvious. These names are by no means moral judgments on the generations themselves. Except screw-ups. Seriously, screw them. Anyways, the civics are driven towards rebuilding or strengthening institutional power while seeking consensus on what that institution should look like. They prefer doing to the thinking of their parents and value cooperation and teamwork. Previous civic generations were the GI generation, otherwise known as the greatest generation, born 1901 to 1924, and the millennials, born 1982 to 2008. I would have mentioned the civics born during the American Civil War seculum, but the third turning was so short that they didn't produce any definitive civic generation, lasting from 1842 to 1843. Finally, we have the conformists, otherwise known as the artist generation. Don't worry, this makes sense, I assure you. They grow up overprotected in the crisis. They see the world as terrifying and dangerous, internalizing cooperation and stability, usually financial stability as they come of age. 
As a result, they tend towards conformity while rarely taking risks or assuming leadership roles themselves. In contrast to the pariahs, the conformists will be the good generation. The last three conformist generations were the progressive generation, born 1843 to 1865, the silent generation, 1925 to 1945, and Generation Z, born 2008 to, well, they're still being born at the time of this recording. Screw-ups, pariahs, civics, and conformists, otherwise known as prophets, nomads, heroes, and artists, respectively. We have the actors for our play, The Seculum, so let's begin. Just to quickly review, each seculum is the duration of a human lifetime, or roughly 80 years. It is divided into four parts, four seasons of roughly 20 years, each occurring in sequence. Let's start from the top. The first turning is the high, an optimistic time characterized by rapid economic expansion. Society demands high social cohesion and unity, and trust in institutions and institutional power are at their zenith. Society knows where it wants to go as a whole, ditch interests fall to the wayside, and great unanswered societal questions from the previous seculum remain unanswered. Those outside the mainstream are pressured to conform. The old screw-ups pass into old age, new screw-ups entering childhood, where, as mentioned previously, they are indulged and driven to ask big questions of society. Conformists enter young adulthood, and being naturally cautious, they seek stability in their relationships and are more likely to be employed by a firm for life than switch jobs and follow the money. They are the primary drivers of the conformist culture. Civics enter middle age, and buoyed by their collective action during the previous crisis and resultant increasing political power, drive society towards lofty goals and overconfident aspirations. Pariahs enter elderhood as the resilient guides of a post-crisis society. Previous first turnings include the post-Civil War Reconstruction Era slash Gilded Age from 1865 to 1882, or Pax Americana from 1945 to 1963. The Reconstruction Era saw rapid industrialization in the United States, which led to some of the most rapid increases in the standard of living for the average person than at any point in history. Comparatively, Pax Americana is a time many screw-up generation baby boomers and remaining conformist and silent generationers recall as the golden years, when economic success was assured, when the middle class surged, crime was under control, and grand society pronouncements such as eliminating poverty seemed within the scope of public policy. The interstate highway system was constructed, and John Kennedy challenged America to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth within the decade, though such a challenge would not be fulfilled within either his lifetime or the high. TV shows like I Love Lucy and Leave it to Beaver were wholesome, showcasing stable family relationships, though bland, while the counterculture criticized the times with movies like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which satirized modern people as so interchangeable nobody noticed when they were replaced by aliens. Eventually, though, people tire of institutional dominance in favor of personal and spiritual fulfillment and self-actualization. They will regard the previous era as spiritually bankrupt, cultureless, a time of bland conformity, though the shift from one turning to another can be catalyzed by a single defining event, as it was by the assassination of John Kennedy in 1964, the growing generation gap between the youth and young adults to aging elders all but ensures that even if Lee Harvey Oswald had missed, Pax Americana had to come to an end, and the second turning was coming. The second turning is the awakening. The previous era is attacked as spiritually bankrupt, stifling and conformist, as society atomizes in search of self-fulfillment. In simple economic terms, supply of social order is high, but demand is low. Old pariahs pass on as new pariahs enter childhood as underprotected. Screw-ups enter young adulthood as the narcissistic moral crusaders were going to see to be a consistent theme throughout the seculum. Conformists enter midlife as both process-oriented and adapting to the needs as helpers to the young adult screw-ups, emerging as sympathetic helpers and spokespeople for the screw-ups' causes. Civics enter elderhood, their prestige gained during the crisis making them extraordinarily politically powerful, but a popular target for attacks against the institutions. Previous second turnings were the first, 
second, and third Great Awakenings from 1724 to 1741, 1822 to 1842, and 1883 to 1900 respectively, all great evangelical movements of Protestant and, to a lesser extent, Catholic thought sweeping throughout Protestant Europe and America. The Third Great Awakening in particular saw the rise of pietism, Billy Sunday evangelicals, labor protests, and the so-called New Woman feminists. If you want to go really far back, the Protestant Reformation, which began when Martin Luther published the 95 Thesis in 1517, occurred during a second turning, which lasted from 1512 to 1540. The most recent second turning was the Consciousness Revolution in the United States, which lasted from 1964 to 1984. This was the era of civil rights, of inner-city riots and tax revolts. Young screw-up boomers protest the civic GI-led Vietnam War while listening to silent generation conformist music like Elvis Presley, The Beatles, and Jimi Hendrix, who in turn participated in movements led by conformist silenters like Martin Luther King Jr. Eventually, the culture itself becomes exhausted and enters a new phase. New civics are born as old civics pass on, raised by overprotective screw-up parents who impart their values onto their children. Pariahs enter young adulthood as alienated, rebellious, yet pragmatic adults. Screw-ups enter midlife as annoying moral busybodies, and conformists enter elderhood as thoughtful, sensitive, but politically powerless elders. Seriously, name one member of the silent generation who ever became president of the United States. I'll wait. The third turning, the unraveling, is the complete inverse of the first turning. Individualism is high, while institutional power is both in low supply and low demand. Society fragments into niche interest groups. It's a time of low manners and personal enjoyment. Previous third turnings included 1742 to 1766 during the French and Indian War. The very brief third turning from 1842 to 1843 saw the Mexican-American War. 1901 to 1924 saw World War I, arguably one of the worst things to happen in modern history, and Prohibition, where pariah lost generationers ran speakeasies and bootlegged alcohol and saw get-rich-quick schemes in the Roaring Twenties. Our most recent third turning was from 1982 to 2008, known as the Long Boom and the Culture Wars. Oh, the culture wars. Society fragmented into dozens of groups with their own opinions on these matters. Take a look. I'm sure if you're politically active, you have your own opinion on at least 20 of these issues. Terrorist attacks in 2001 sparked national unity in the United States, but it fizzled away with the controversy of the Iraq War. Grunge, hip-hop, and punk rock demonstrated an embittered and edgy youth culture on the ascendancy pushing the boundaries of acceptability while new technologies like the internet allow people to find content catered to their individual interests. In many ways, the unraveling is the most individually enjoyable of the turnings to live through, though the wheel of time turns and a new perceived threat rises to challenge society's very survival. Institutions look ill-equipped to deal with it as the very foundations on which the institutions exist seem poised to collapse at any moment. The unraveling ends and the fourth turning is upon us. The eponymous fourth turning is the crisis, the most exciting yet terrifying of the secular turnings. Old conformists pass on as new conformists enter childhood as the protected children of parents preoccupied by the ongoing crisis. Civics enter young adulthood with an optimistic group orientation. Pariahs enter midlife as pragmatic leaders, while screw-up elders are the narcissistic hands overseeing the crisis. Cultural fragmentation reaches its zenith, and problems in society are believed to be either the result of institutional failings or institutions themselves. In response to an existential threat, society coalesces into a single, larger identity. People find common ground and drive forward with community purpose. Institutional power is low, but demand is high. By no means is this a simple expansion to the awakening and unraveling's contraction, however. In fact, institutions and institutional life is torn down and rebuilt from the ground up. The old order is swept away as societal identity is refreshed and redefined. Society answers great societal questions with clear, concise, and indisputable terms with obvious winners and losers. 
the engine of society mobilizes with more clarity and action to drive through this great gateway in history. Fourth turnings are events memorialized, its veterans, the civic generation, are legendary heroes, and its screw-up leaders are immortalized, the victors as the great sages of history, the losers, villains, who will live forever in infamy. If you need proof, just ask someone on the street what they think of Winston Churchill or Adolf Hitler. Previous fourth turnings include the American Revolution from 1767 to 1791, characterized by rampant tax revolts and increasing authoritarianism on the part of the British colonial government in an effort to collect payment for their assistance in the French and Indian War from the previous third turning. The American Revolutionary Movement coalesced around its new order and overturned the old order of the British colonial governments, establishing itself and answering the question of the viability of self-governance. The American Civil War from 1843 to 1865 saw the secession of the Confederate states from the wider nation over frontier states being legally permitted or refused to have slaves by the federal government. American society coalesced into two factions, with the Northern Union side galvanized into total abolition of slavery, which was implemented upon their victory. The twin crises of the Great Depression and World War II from 1925 to 1945 saw total breakdown of institutional trust following the failure of financial markets, the newly formed Federal Reserve Central Bank, and government. Missionary generation screw up Franklin Roosevelt was criticized for his heavy-handed attempt at fixing the economy, including trying to stack the Supreme Court. However, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States declared war on Japan the very next day. Our most recent fourth turning is from 2008 to ongoing at the time of this recording. So what can I say about where we are in the speculum at this moment? I'll tell you all about that in part three. Once the battles are fought and the victor is decided in concrete and indisputable terms, the engine of society roars into action and the people complete the speculum and propelled by an optimism about their future and learning the lessons of their lived history, People are ready and mobilized as the wheel of time turns into a new seculum, and the new first turning begins. Okay, so that's a lot to take in, but what I gave is actually a very simplified version. Read the book yourself if you want more detail, but if you made it this far, then here's a very simple way to think about the seculum. The first turning, good people bring good times. The second turning, good times make bad people. The third turning, Bad people bring bad times. And the fourth turning. Bad times make good people. There, see? That wasn't so hard. So where are we now, and what do we do? Stay tuned for part three and part four, and I'll tell you all about it. Questions? Comments? Critique? Where do you see yourself in the seculum? Do you hate this screw-up generation as much as I do? Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.